Security and Space, so it's ADSS, joint lecture. For those of you who go back a few years, this was this is the trade union, you might say, of the UK manufacturing industry, and it used to call itself USBAC. Our president of the Toulouse branch, uh, David Marshall, worked for, he was the director for SBAC, and he arranged that we could have this annual lecture. And I was greatly privileged for Ian to come on to talk about the roles of universities. Just to remind you yet again, those of you who've seen this before I know, is the Royal Aeronautical Society, started in 1866, so it's now 151 years old. The main thing to remind yourself is that it was started to share knowledge, and that's why we're here today, based in London, and we have support from Airbus, who have refurbished the basement several times. <coughs> and we now have some 66 branches in 20 countries worldwide. The Toulouse branch was started in 1991, which by Gordon Hall, primarily. And we encourage you, of course, to join the main society, which you can do online nowadays. And we have application forms, probably not tonight, but uh, we are now changing the name probably, instead of saying friend of the branch, to say we'll come Toulouse branch member. So we. That really is act of faith. You pay 10 euros, which is just to help us with our expenses for traveling uh, speakers. So we have Professor Chris Atkin here as the, our president. Do you want to say anything, Chris? Or? Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> so we then come to Sorry, Ian Gray. And I just copied this because Ian very kindly was talking to us 10 years ago. And those of you who think about Brexit are very happy to know that uh, Ian is a Scot. <laughs> <laughs> very much a Scot from Aberdeen University, you'll see. But then, of course, he was enveloped by the Sassanax down south and joined the instructor's office. I hope they've got that right. And you can see here these various mergers. Um, he went back to Southampton University for further education. Then he went once more back to British Aerospace. As you can see, that's progressively come to Airbus stuff. He was uh, in, involved in the A3XX, which of course became later the A380. He became VA Systems and Airbus Director of Strategy and External Affairs. Then he went on, as you can see, to be in charge of Airbus UK and a mixed member of the extended executive committee of Airbus. Then, of course, after he left Airbus in 2008, he became Chief Executive Innovator, which was the Technology Strategy Board, looking at uh, developing UK technology. And then he became... Oh, 2015. Uh, <laughs> going back to, uh, to the invasion of the uh, UK <laughs> by the French. 2015, sorry about that. He became Director of Aerospace. University. He has many fellowships of many uh, organizations, I've just included there. He's a fellow of the Royal Academy, of course he's a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and to emphasize, he's also a fellow vice president to, of the Royal Society of Edinburgh to emphasize his Scottish roots. So we welcome Ian Gray. Thank you, Duke. Um, thank you, uh, you thank, can, I, can you hear yes. me if I stand here? Yeah. I feel like I'm hide, hide, hiding under there. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Um, it's good to see some friends, former colleagues, 
um, here today. It's a great privilege to be uh, to be asked. Very fond memories, uh, Alan and Jeff, of uh, working for for you in, in this very very building. Um, and, and that little introduction about me, he reminded me of some jobs I had forgotten, uh, long since forgotten about. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to uh, talk to you about uh, tonight is the role of universities. I, I, I've had a career where universities have been part of my life, virtually my whole working career. But I've been looking at universities through different te ends of a telescope every time. I've looked at them from a an industry point of view, I've looked at it from a government point of view, and now I'm part of a university. And I, and I see it slightly differently, and I, I thought it would be worth just sharing with you um, the two years I've had in, in Cranfield University in, in, in particular, and the role that I think universities can play in shaping and, and defining a future aviation vision. Um, it was great just to see, uh, I, I slipped this slide in actually, Hugh, after our conversation of coffee <laughs> um, this afternoon. Uh, very, very fond memories of uh, the 10 year ago period as you described it and working uh, here in Airbus as, as, as part of the A380 programme. I know the A380 itself is going through some programme difficulties, the production numbers are not uh, where we would uh, all want them to be. but. I, I believe that product is a real symbol of uh, how we all managed to work together in a very different way. It's certainly my proudest moment was the uh, 27th of April 2005 when the A380 took off for the uh, very, very, uh, very first time. And just one or two little pictures of, uh, of my memories uh, of it uh, flying over the Broughton factory, flying with the red arrows, the wings, first wing being delivered from, from Broughton. So very, very fond memories. So thanks for uh, reminding me uh, of, of, of that to you. But really what I wanted to talk to uh, you today was, uh, was something a little bit different, the role of uh, universities. I was prompted on this subject, actually only two or three weeks ago, I was down in Toulouse um, for what was called the Airbus Global University Partnerships uh, Programme over in the new Airbus uh, headquarters building, a magnificent uh, new building, if I might say so, over on the, the formal Aerospatial site, if I, if I remember the geography right. This was a, a, a meeting, there were about um, um, 30, 40 people from across the Airbus system and 30, 40 people from universities uh, around the world that Airbus has formed a partnership with. And we were very privileged to have Tom Enders, the CEO, of Airbus come along and, um, and, and address us. Said some quite uh, inspiring things to my mind um, about the direction of the industry. But there were two, two things that particularly sort of pricked my mind that I, I, I picked up on. One is, his basic premise was that uh, notwithstanding that the industry, uh, well the Royal Aeronautical Society has just celebrated its uh, 150th anniversary last year, in big picture terms, we're probably entering into what is the third revolution in aerospace. The first revolution being right back in those early days and the Wright brothers. The second uh, revolution probably being towards the end of the 50s and the 60s and the introduction of the jet engine, um, the mid 60s, all the development work on, on, on Concorde. And what we've seen is a kind of natural evolution of all of that, those kind of uh, capabilities. But now, with the accelerating rate of technology itself, we are on the brink of a, a third revolution in, in, in aerospace. And that kind of struck a, a chord um, with me. And the other thing he said was from an Airbus point of view, he said, uh, as, a, as, a, as a corporate, as a company, we can no longer, he said, I, as CEO, can no longer be expected to know everything about everything. He said, we have to rely on our partners partnerships, whether that be industry partnerships or university partnerships. But it was the university partnerships that really struck a, a chord with me, because I'm not 100% convinced over my career that we have taken maximum advantage of the capability that exists in universities. So that's really what prompted me for this talk to say, so what is the role of universities? 
what I intend to, to uh, talk about, a little bit about universities, what universities are involved in aerospace, maybe a couple of examples, particularly Airbus and Rolls-Royce, how they interact with, uh, with, with universities. Talk a bit about the market and the main market challenges and where I think universities can play a role. And then talk about technology itself, technology both in a, an aerospace platform sense as we would know it, but also technology in a, in a broader aviation uh, kind of context. And then kind of conclude with a, a what next. I can't uh, not draw your attention to the picture on the, uh, well, what for you is the right hand side of the screen, which is um, pictures, images of our new Aerospace Integration Research Centre based at uh, Cranfield, uh, a new £35 million facility. We've received the keys just uh, six weeks ago. It was achieved with the uh, contribution, some £10 million contribution from Airbus itself. So a very, very big part. Uh, thank you to, uh, to Airbus for its contribution in, in that centre. So universities themselves, I uh, couldn't resist uh, with our former president of the Royal Aeronautical Society, uh, Chris Atkin, Professor Chris Atkin. Chris is a, a very esteemed um, scholar with industry background himself um, from City University in, in, in London. And City University actually was the universi first university in the UK to offer uh, an aeronautical uh, degree. I think that was back in, in 1909. So universities have been part of the aerospace sector since the, uh, since the very, very beginning. Naturally, I'm probably going to focus a little bit more tonight on Cranfield University. I joined um, Cranfield University some two years ago. I uh, went up and met the uh, Vice Chancellor of, of Cranfield University for a, a couple of dinners to discuss where Cranfield should be taking um, itself as an institution from an aerospace point of view and got absolutely hooked on the uh, capabilities that exist there. And if there was one thing that actually drove me to say Cranfield is where I want to work, it was probably this picture here. Cranfield is the only university in the UK, I believe it's the only university in, in Europe that owns its own airport and its own runway. And in um, the UK, I mean, it's sometimes difficult for you guys to uh, in Toulouse to, uh, to imagine the, uh, the destruction I think we have uh, made of much of our aerospace legacy in, in the UK by digging up runways, closing airports, closing, closing runways. To have a university that has its own airfield and its own asset was an absolute draw to me. That, that meant that we could at Cranfield start to do things that shape the aerospace uh, agenda moving forward. It's not a huge runway, it's an 1800 metre uh, runway, somewhat embarrassingly uh, in, in Toulouse. At the end of a runway there's a, there's a, a Boeing 737 parked, which was a, an ex-British Airways 737 when Tom Williams came and visited uh, Cranfield. I said the good news is because that aircraft is parked at Cranfield, Airbus now have two extra Airbus in the uh, British Airways fleet, so there was a, an upside <laughs> from, from, from an Airbus point of view. But that's the kind of the size of aeroplane we can bring in to, uh, to Cranfield. 146s, A320s, 737s, as well as the general aviation market. In terms of um, Cranfield um, University itself, there are some things that you would expect, traditional things uh, associated with a, an aerospace university. We have great facilities, we've got a gas turbine um, test laboratory, we've got wind tunnels which are part of a national wind tunnel test facility, we've got a, an, an icing lab, we've got um, significant hangar space where we can do uh, whole aircraft kind of research um, capabilities. We've got uh, a lot of capability around systems, systems integration, kind of facilities. We've got, with Rolls-Royce, one of our university technology uh, centres. There's some um, terrific capability. There's a lovely little picture there, the fourth picture um, along, 
which is uh, Cranfield Airport, is one of, as I understand it, one of only two airfields in Europe where we can actually do water ingestion trials. And we do water ingestion trials for smaller aircraft as well. So again, so, a real impressive um, aerospace capability at uh, Cran Cranfield. Of course, Cranfield is um, not, not alone. It's not alone in the UK. It's not alone in Europe. It's not alone in, in, in the globe. We uh, at Cranfield are establishing very close and strong relationships with uh, major European universities, Supero. I noticed just last week Mr. Champion has been appointed as the chairman of the board of Supero. And we're doing a lot of work with TU Delft and a lot of work with, uh, with, uh, with Hamburg. And I think something that is often misunderstood in industry about universities is their desire and appetite to actually work in a collaborative sense. It was certainly my experience when I was in, in, in industry that you felt that universities were acting for themselves very singularly, um, and I didn't recognize the uh, collaborative nature of universities, if incentivized in the, uh, in the right way. In the UK itself, we've got uh, a number of universities that uh, specialize in, in, in aerospace, Interestingly uh, enough, there is an organization called the Association of Aerospace Universities. Um, when I did a bit of research into that, it doesn't, to my mind, necessarily have the big players that I would expect to see in an association of uh, aerospace universities. But again, it can reinforce um, the collaborative nature that universities can have if you incentivize them in the right way. And in a global sense, then um, working with the likes of uh, Singapore, NUS, Nanyang Technology University, working with China, Beihan, Shanghai, Jiao Tong, working with the US, Virginia Tech, Georgia Tech, MIT, Caltech, was a relatively small number of, of universities. And I guess the one learning point I have had is that community, that aerospace community across the globe um, really can work together to help support the needs of business. Again, I would say, if, if incentivized in the right way. So what is the role of universities? I mean, there's a fairly conventional and well understood uh, role of, of universities, the teaching and the learning side of it, the continued professional development side of it, the executive uh, development side of it, the research that goes on across universities. But I, I think, in a mindset point of view, one of the big transformations in universities is that universities have started to recognize the economic role that they create in, in society, that they play in society, the economic role in supporting business and industry in a productivity sense. I guess the other key role they play is in terms of employability and providing that pipeline of young people who are going to join the industry with key skills and, and, and capabilities. So universities do have uh, a very strong role. How do different industries play that? Airbus um, have a scheme which they have called the Airbus Global University Partner Programme. This particular program is more focused around employability, how the uh, company reaches out to universities for future, um, future employees. It uh, has, however, moved into the sort of area of, of innovation and people like Jan Barbo at, uh, at uh, Airbus are very closely involved in the Airbus Group University Partnership Program. Airbus's program um, is in place with a number of universities. I think it's about 15 universities from across the globe. Singapore, um, I think there's a, a plan for uh, India, the US, Georgia, um, Georgia Tech in, in, in Europe. Certainly the universities are listed, Supero, Hamburg, TU Delft and, and others. And in the UK there's about four universities that are part of the universe, global university partnership program, Cranfield, uh, Manchester, Bristol, and Imperial, I think, is, is, is the fourth one. So it's quite interesting to see how Airbus have established 
uh, a formal relationship with universities through its global university uh, par partner programme. In terms of some of the examples of the kind of activity that uh, get run, I, I'm staggered actually how few colleagues I know inside the Airbus system itself were aware of the Airbus Global University Partnership Programme. Most of my engineering um, colleagues have never heard, never heard of it. So I think there's a bit of a job to be done inside the company to, to promote that, that kind of relationship. But one of the things they did, which was a real success last summer, was they ran a, an innovation summer school at TU Delft. And they brought students from across those uh, preferred universities together, about, um, I think there was about 50 uh, students. And they ran a, a sort of a one week hackathon um, which, which actually had, was challenge led, it was about developing a, a UAV um, that could, could fulfill a, a particular mission. And I think it showed again the, uh, the inspirational role that a university working with um, a large company, a large company defining a, 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 a challenge and inspiring the students to uh, achieve that was enormously successful and I think a really good model of, of how a large company can interact with uh, universities on, um, on an employability perspective. At Cranfield itself, we, we, we celebrated our 70th anniversary last year. We had a festival of flight and the Airbus Global Partnership Programme was part of that. Um, Airbus itself, for the very first time last year, actually sponsored our um, Air, aerospace vehicle uh, group design project and they sponsored it in a way that they actually defined a, a specification for an aeroplane, not one that would necessarily be uh, built or, or uh, conceived in the uh, coming years, but one that had in it many of the trade-offs that uh, the future projects office would want to do. And so they were able to use the students inside the university to carry out various technical trade-offs and feed that back into the Airbus Future Projects Office. So that for me is just a, you know, an example of one company, a very relevant company here in Toulouse and how they interact with, uh, with universities. Another example, a very significant uh, UK engineering example, is Rolls-Royce. And Rolls-Royce have established a rather different model in terms of how they interact with universities. And the Rolls-Royce model is much more based around research and research uh, concepts. I include in the diagram here a, a quote from Rick Parker. I'm sure a number of you know uh, Rick Parker. Rick uh, um, retired from Rolls-Royce at the, uh, the end of last year, but he was their uh, um, technical and, and, and research director. He's still, uh, I think, chairman of Clean Skies. Rick had a vision and a model which was actually one that said rather than Rolls-Royce having its own corporate research centres, it would rely entirely on universities to develop its research. And Rolls-Royce set up what was called a university technology centre model. So they're one of the few corporations that outsourced their complete research uh, agenda, not their development agenda, but their research agenda into the university base. And they set up a little bit like a, a, a technology work breakdown structure, centers of excellence, university technology centers around the globe. They have a university technology center again in Singapore, they have ones in India, they have a couple in the United States, they have a number around, uh, around Europe and a number in, inside, the, uh, inside the UK itself. And Rolls-Royce then provide the glue and the gel that brings all these university technology centres together and tries to integrate and coordinate the technology research activities that go on across the universities. Cranfield has a university um, technology centre in performance engineering. Also in line with Cranfield's role as, a, as an integrator, Rolls-Royce are increasingly looking on the research side for Cranfield to act as an integrator of, of their research. And in fact, it's quite interesting, they look to organisations like Cranfield University 
to act as the proxy for an overall aircraft manufacturer so that when they come and talk to the OEMs, they can have a, a conversation that understands a bit more where the OEM might be coming from. So that is a, a very different kind of uh, research model. University technology centres conducting research on behalf of the company around, around the world. The good news, I mean, I, again, just being parochial about Cranfield's perspective, the students that are involved in doing that university research <coughs> for Rolls-Royce, there's a very high percentage of them actually end up working for the company. So it's actually a very good recruitment um, and employability model. It's so very different from the Airbus model, but another example of how an aerospace engineering company can interact with a, a large, large corporate. From a Cranfield perspective, just a couple of the teaching and learning um, opportunities which uh, we have, which I think are, um, are, are invaluable. First is, I mean, Cranfield as a university uh, has, uh, has its own design organization approvals through a company called uh, Cranfield Aerospace Solutions. It actually also has its own AOC and has its own small fleet of uh, aircraft. It predominantly uses a jet stream, a jet stream 31, as its teaching aircraft. And it's an aircraft that actually is labelled as the National Flying Laboratory. And so university students who are studying aerospace in universities around the UK quite often have a, a one-week uh, module which involves flying in the Cranfield <laughs> Jetstream um, aeroplane. As an aerospace uh, guy myself, I think, sadly, um, not enough um, of the people that come into the industry now understand overall aircraft and they don't get that experience of actually flying and, and, and being part of um, an overall aircraft uh, solution. And I think that jet stream uh, capability into undergraduate and postgraduate training courses is an invaluable um, contribution that the, the universities can make. The other uh, aspect of uh, Cranfield's um, aerospace agenda and it was interesting, a couple of people um, spoke to me just before we uh, started who were either um, students who had studied at Cranfield and done the overall aerospace vehicle and design group project or, or indeed had um, sons or, or daughters who had done the uh, module at, at Cranfield. And what we try and do at Cranfield from a university perspective is emulate the way industry would work together. So we specify um, a particular, uh, we produce an initial specification for a, an aeroplane and students spend about six months in a group of around 60 to 70 students broken down into natural work teams with a work breakdown structure to develop that aeroplane up to a standard that in industry terms would be like close to um, uh, an authorization to offer kind of point. But with some fairly detailed engineering structures, systems, uh, drawings behind it, a business plan behind it. Um, and, and the group actually works in, in um, a self-managed kind of way with project management, teams looking after structures for different parts of the aeroplane, teams looking after the avionics, people looking after the power plant and prop propulsion side or the landing gear side. So it's a very good way of actually the university sort of emulating that um, overall industry uh, way, way of working. The most recent um, project, we, in fact just last week, um, concluded the, the last round of our aerospace vehicle design group project. And the spe specification for, for uh, that project was a, a hybrid electric um, aeroplane, some very distinctive features which uh, you can see from the, the diagram itself, it was a, it was a, a hybrid electric, but it was um, rear fuselage, high mounted uh, engines. It was a, an elliptical um, fuselage. It had sufficient batteries uh, in it for around about 150 nautical mile uh, range. And the students worked, worked through structural trade-offs and systems trade-offs. 
So again, a, a, a good example of how the university is preparing students um, for industry for, for tomorrow. And in industry itself, um, not many people have the good fortune of working at an overall aircraft level. Many people spend many years becoming detailed specialists in, in certain areas. So that opportunity to see the overall aircraft and how it works is a, is a, is a, is a great opportunity. So that's just a, a sort of little introduction about universities, the type of universities that exist, and, and some examples of how we interact with the, uh, the sector. Just um, changing gear uh, a little bit now, just a, I mean a small bit around the, the, the market and some of the, uh, the grand challenges that, that exist and how universities can kind of uh, get, it, get engaged in, in that. You need no introduction to uh, the fact that a key focus over recent years has been around productivity improvement, about achieving ramp up of uh, produ production rates. Um, sometimes people forget just how much innovation has gone on. The general public, going back to Tom Ender's third aerospace revolution, you know, a lot of people do hold that perspective that not a lot has changed over the last 25, 30 years. Um, you still have a, a, a cigar tube as a, as, a, as, a, as a fuselage section. But actually, when you look at what's gone on in an, aer in an aeroplane, there is terrific innovation. And I think just these pictures is Boeing and Airbus side, side by side, and you look at the wings and the innovation and the difference um, that those wings have compared to the wings of, of even 10, 15 years ago. It's, uh, there's enormous innovation um, uh, gone on in, in the industry. The market, however, I mean, the market continues to, uh, to, to grow very, very um, significantly. I think by uh, 2034, um, the market's expected to, uh, to double again in, in, in size. The, these uh, market projections, which are IATA produced, I think they're quite nice in that they just show from a, a geographic, a, a density point of view, just what that uh, growth in, in air traffic really means. But I think from a you know, technology and a university perspective, just seeing that change, that increase in, in the market itself, begs the question, so what can we do? I mean, there must be opportunities out there from a technology point of view, given that, um, that volume increase in, uh, in, in air traffic uh, growth. And, 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 and sure, I mean, the, the success of the, uh, the 320 size, the 737 size aeroplane, I mean, nobody could have envisaged uh, I certainly wouldn't have envisaged the uh, production volumes of those uh, aeroplanes. I remember the government launch investment case for the A320 assumed a, a lifetime sale of around 650 aeroplanes, and we're now producing nearly 650 a, a year. It's you know it's ab absolutely incredible. But notwithstanding all of that, I believe there is a, a huge opportunity um, for universities to contribute next generation technologies and, and as I said earlier, we must see an opportunity from an innovation perspective that comes with the uh, increased volume. And that, that, that is what excites people, that's what's going to draw young students into aerospace and into the sector. We need to sort of maximise that. The big challenges, the ACARI challenges, the Flight Path 2050 uh, challenges, ones around uh, environment are well understood. Um, there's still a long way to go to, uh, to achieve the environmental goals that uh, um, we've, we've, the challenges we've, uh, we've, we've set ourselves. Notwithstanding the uh, big success that we've had along the way, just that volume itself, every time we increase, in, improve the environmental uh, performance of an aeroplane, we've, dub we, you know, we've, we've kind of negated it just with the increase in, uh, in fleet size and aircraft uh, flying. So there's still some very big uh, challenges and Akari is a good way of uh, capturing from a European point of view the, the challenges. Cranfield plays into that agenda very strongly and I, I think one of the big success stories in um, the UK in, in Cranfield that's not told very uh, much is the uh, FAM 146 aeroplane. 
That's found future atmospheric airborne measurement aeroplane. Um, for those aficionados of uh, aeroplanes, that actually is the uh, 146 100 MSN 1, which was uh, converted into a, a flight test um, aeroplane. But from a, an equipment point of view, a research point of view, that is probably one of the most equipped aeroplanes in the, uh, the Western world. Companies can use that for experimental uh, uh, purposes. Government labs can use it for experimental purposes. And that aircraft was modified, is operated from Cranfield and Cran Cranfield's airport and, and runway. So, you know, a, a big contribution that perhaps is a, a story that uh, we, don't, we don't tell very, very often. Another aspect of um, the Akari challenges is the things like the, uh, the four-hour door-to-door challenge or the congestion uh, challenge times for takeoff and, 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 and landing. And again, universities play a, a very strong role in, in, in that agenda. We, we are working very closely in the UK with what's called the Transport Systems Catapult. The Catapult was a, an innovation centre that was set up to accelerate the, uh, the adoption of research that happens in the academic base or in small businesses into commercial exploitation opportunities. So there's a lot of uh, um, university contribution in the Akari challenges around logistics and the, uh, the four hours door-to-door -door -door challenge. So universities are playing a big role in helping to shape and, and define those challenges. <coughs> Switching to just some of the technology things that are happening in universities themselves. And I, I, I start actually from a, a position of envy in a sense when I look at um, just how much money is being invested in the States at the moment through the NASA technology program. There are a, a number of, of, of elements of the NASA technology program that are directly related to uh, civil aerospace, whether it be around nanotechnology, systems, materials, and performance. But in particular, what's called Chapter 15, the aeronautics, when we're seeing the return of the, uh, the X-plane kind of program from a government-funded point of view in, in the US. And Europe somehow has to get its act together to respond to, uh, to, uh, to those, those challenges. Um, there are, uh, I think, four different X-plane concepts that the, uh, the US are, are progressing. I mean, I guess it's all slightly subject at the moment to where the current US um, government takes its science and, and R&D budget. But this year alone, the expectation was they were spending some $790 million. Um, <coughs> dollars. And over a, a sort of 10-year program, it was something like $100 billion, t no, sorry, $10 billion they, they were investing in their X planes. So we need to do a lot. We need to respond quite strongly to, to that challenge, I, I, I believe, in, in Europe. There's a number of projects that, that are going on that universities are engaged in, and, and some of them are, I think, likely to succeed. Some of them, I think, are uh, much more difficult. I think supersonic falls into the category of being much more uh, difficult. I'm not convinced that in our lifetime we'll see a next generation supersonic. It's somewhat um, sad to, uh, to think that in 2019, just 18 or 19 months away, we'll be celebrating 50 years since the first flight of uh, Concorde. And, you know, that was a remarkable technical achievement and it does seem to me that we've uh, kind of gone backwards in, 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 in that regard. Universities are involved in supersonic research, I would say uh, predominantly in areas around uh, aerodynamics, high-speed um, um, aerodynamics, a little bit around thermal management. There are a number of uh, projects that uh, are uh, out there at the moment. There's a Lockheed producing supersonic uh, demonstrator as part of the X-Plane program. There's um, Boom, who are uh, promising to, uh, to fly a a demonstrator program, I think, in the next sort of 18 months, two years, and have a, a small, uh, I think it's a Mach 2.2 uh, aeroplane flying with passengers by 2023. There's a particular picture there of 
uh, a Mach 1.4 uh, supersonic. My personal view is that supersonic comes around every 10 years in terms of people examining the art of the possible. I'm, I'm not convinced um, that, that, that it will happen. But universities should be playing a key part in some of the fundamental uh, technologies around that. In the UK, we have um, projects like reaction engines, a hypersonic uh, um, project, remarkable engineering um, technology behind the, uh, the engine itself. And the key secret to that is the, uh, is this, the, the cooling, the, uh, the uh, technologies that can take temperatures at, say, 1,000 degrees down to sort of min minus 150 degrees in something like a 20th of a, a second. I think it's a terrific engineering sort of uh, capability that's been developed, and in a military sense, I can see very, very strong interest in it. But when people start talking about that in a civil aerospace sense, or using that as a platform for uh, uh, hypersonic um, civil projects, I don't think that's going to happen in our lifetime again. But again, I would say universities must play a key role in some of the underpinning capabilities and, and, and technologies that are there. Somewhat ironically, and at a very different speed, a sort of max speed of about 80 knots, uh, loitering speed of about 20 knots, the, uh, the hybrid air vehicle um, airship, which uh, made its first flight uh, last year. It uh, had an unfortunate incident on its second flight, but it's made its first flight uh, in 2017, just uh, last week, and I believe it made its uh, second flight um, just just today. That's a, a, a lifting vehicle. A lot of the aerodynamic work that went into the uh, hybrid air vehicle was actually done at uh, Cranfield University. It's a hybrid, uh, a hybrid product. I believe there is significant potential moving forward for it to become a, a hybrid, um, hybrid electric uh, vehicle. Looking for clients and customers now that are defense customers probably one of the uh, significant uh, operators of that may be a, a tourist kind of uh, client that, that uses it for loitering over uh, maybe uh, nature reserves think, think, things like that the point is you know the universities have been playing a key role in much of the uh, enabling technologies there Going back to Akari and, and, and some of the challenges there, there's a, a, there's a technology refresh actually going on with Akari at the moment. And, and one of the key questions there is just even in the last three to five years, what are the technologies that, that are changing? And there are two or three themes that are coming through quite strongly in terms of the art of the possible and, and changes. One is the potential around electric and hybrid electric aircraft. That's seen as emerging as a potential real um, possibility. The uh, greater role and strength of uh, remotely piloted air vehicles or, or UAVs, increasing uh, use of autonomy is, uh, is, is recognized. Key emerging technologies around uh, materials. But probably the biggest change that's happening right around us at the moment is the whole subject of digital and the uh, sort of digital sort of innovation uh, agenda. And I think, again, universities have played a very strong role here. I mean, it was within a university environment that the World Wide Web was kind of uh, established, work, working with uh, defense um, agencies. But if you, if you look at that world of digital now and the connectivity between different parts of the environment, different parts of the infrastructure exist, the, the possibilities around digital, I think, are probably the biggest game changer as we move into the next generation of technologies. And universities do have a key role to play in helping shape and define what those opportunities are. In the UK, we've um, established the um, Aerospace Growth Partnership. It's been in, in place now for probably about five, five years. It's a, a, a partnership between government and, and industry. It's looking at the skills agenda, the technology agenda, the supply chain agenda, the finance uh, agenda. And one of the big things that AGP set up was the uh, Aerospace um, Technology Institute, the, the ATI. The ATI has something of the order of 
four billion pounds um, to invest industry and government money working together to invest in future research. And that's helping to bring industry and universities working together. The fund is not for universities per se, it's to help promote and develop capability for industry, but it has really acted as a catalyst for industry and universities uh, working together. So the Aerospace Technology Institute, I think, has been a real galvaniser in, in terms of bringing universities and, and business together. And there's some great and very big, substantial projects of universities and uh, industry working together through, through ATI. ATI helped establish in the UK what was a national wind tunnel test facility network. The UK made some big decisions, in my view the wrong decisions, but some big decisions a couple of decades ago when it closed a number of its national research organisations down. And it's building that capability back up through networking and through networking of uh, um, facilities. So the National Wind Tunnel Test Facility is a network of facilities that goes on across the UK. A number of those facilities exist within universities working alongside industry again. Other technologies that for me are, uh, are significant, the whole composites world of uh, composites continues to, to, to move on. I still find it uh, bizarre, I mean it was 40, 50 years ago that composites first uh, got discovered and, and, and invented. It took decades for it to kind of flow through into, uh, in, into mainstream. We've now got A350 and 787, fairly extensive use of uh, composites, but I do wonder whether, again, we're taking maximum advantage of those kind of uh, capabilities. And universities quite often see what's going on in other sectors. And whereas the aerospace sector traditionally leads on a number of these things, when it's come to the exploitation of some of these uh, capabilities, there are other sectors I think are moving faster and, and taking more advantage of uh, composites capability. So again, that knowledge that exists within the universities of what's happening in other sectors is quite often something that I think the aerospace sector could, uh, could take advantage of. The picture on the right, Paul Drayson, Lord Drayson's uh, sports car, I mean, he's really kind of pioneered the, the sort of embedded systems inside of uh, composites and some really great high performance uh, applications there. The world of uh, 3D printing, um, big, I think it's a, a game changer in, uh, in manufacturing terms. A lot of it started off in fairly academic uh, terms, but it's now moving into some pretty serious uh, applications. Um, this particular uh, picture here, this is um, Rolls-Royce. Um, it's done for a Rolls-Royce engine, but this is high strength nickel. Uh, nickel alloys. This isn't sort of gimmicky little 3D printed parts. These are fairly substantial um, parts that are now being produced in, in by additive layer manufacturing. At Cranfield, the kind of capability that we're really developing and leading the way, way on is wire and arc um, welding, 3D printing, to produce large parts where the, traditionally from a forging point of view, the buy to fly ratio is um, is very, very uh, high. We, we probably threw away 85, 90% of the, uh, the part. The part on the left was a, a trial part for a, I think it was a, a landing gear uh, forging. The uh, equipment on, on, on the right hand side we put in place at Cranfield University and it developed um, what was the world's largest 3D, uh, 3D printed part. What we're seeing from a technology point of view is particularly through some of the post, the, the processing uh, that we do in real time alongside the uh, deposition of the material, the cold rolling, is actually giving us material properties that are greater than the forgings themselves. So not only are we significantly improving the buy to fly, but we're also actually getting some fairly su substantial uh, material um, benefits coming from it as well. So I think that's a, that's a technology that's being developed 
um, in, in Cranfield and we're working with a number of big companies um, on that at the moment. We have a new miracle material coming along, graphene. Um, I'm actually a, a slight conflict of interest. I'm a non-exec director in this company called uh, Versarian. Versarian's establishing itself to become the UK's number one um, graphene player. But the links to universities there are mainly through acquisition. This company has acquired a company in Cambridge, Cambridge Graphene. It's acquired a company at Manchester University where a lot of the graphene um, discovery happened, a small company called 2D Tech. And the applications of graphene, both in terms of embedded graphene in composites and providing structural strength properties, strength properties per se itself, and also, I think in particular, um, where I see big applications for graphene is around battery and battery technologies. So again, university, university developing science and research, that being exploited through companies, small companies, those companies being acquired and becoming the engine of growth for the future is a, a good model of how universities can work with, uh, with business. CPI, the Centre for Process Industries, up in the UK has been working on uh, OLED uh, capability with um, some of the universities in the northeast of, uh, of England, looking particularly in aerospace terms at being able to use large flexible screens for windowless aircraft or back of the seat uh, um, entertainment kind, kind of capability. We're doing um, a lot of work at Cranfield around um, automation, working with Airbus, looking at humans, working together with uh, robots on various wing assembly uh, capabilities. The university, surprisingly enough, has about 12 of its students permanently located out in Airbus uh, factories in both Bristol and, and, and Broughton. So again, a good example of how a university can work very close to the technology readiness levels being adopted inside uh, industry. Another new technology, uh, I remember years ago, the first sort of introduction of Ohm's operational loads measurement, which I guess was the, the forerunner of the kind of capability we're now seeing with vehicle health, uh, health management systems, where real-time information is being analysed, not just from a diagnostic perspective, but from a, a prognostic perspective, and being fat passed back to uh, service centres. And we're starting to see technologies that look at aircraft healing themselves. So again, a combination of digital kind of capabilities alongside um, the more traditional uh, experience inside uh, large OEMs, bringing new capability. And, and the universities themselves being a, a key driver of, of that technology. Cranfield's been involved in a number of uh, demonstrator um, projects. The Astrea aircraft, the Jetstream aircraft in BAE systems colours there, was the very first aircraft to fly as a, an unmanned aeroplane. It had a surrogate pilot sat in the back of the, uh, the uh, aeroplane. That aeroplane was, was modified at Cranfield. It was flown by a Cranfield University pilot and um, sat, sat in the back seat. So a really good demonstrator example of where a university can play very close to uh, industry uh, technology levels. Two demonstrator projects that Cranfield has been involved in over the last few years, which I found fascinating and, and really interesting. This one here, Flavier, was a, an eight million pound demonstrator project. It was done with seven universities all working together and Cranfield was the uh, prime integrator. It was a UAV demonstrator, but from a technology point of view, its real first was it was the world's first flapless aeroplane. It was a um, fluidic uh, device uh, controlled through the uh, engine offtake and, and, and it was the Coander effect that actually was used for both lift and, um, and, and roll control on, on the aeroplane. That was a demonstrator project that successfully uh, flew, built, brought together at Cranfield. The demonstrator on the right was the, uh, the NASA flying wing concept, the X-48B. Um, Cranfield acted as prime contractor 
for that flying wing demonstrator project and we had Boeing as a subcontractor to a university. Amazing to think that a small university had a major company like Boeing acting as a, as a supplier uh, to it. That successfully uh, flew. Cranfield actually did not just the uh, development of the, uh, the flying wing demonstrator, but it carried out all of the uh, flight test program in the, uh, in, in, in the deserts in, in the States. In fact, there were two aircraft uh, built, and, and that whole project stemmed from a student that had worked at Cranfield and had done a flying wing demonstrator project as a design group project. So it was a really good example of how a student had taken an idea from his initial classroom ideas all the way through into a multi-million pound uh, demonstrator program. <coughs> probably hadn't sh wasn't showing you the right picture when I described that. Um, UAVs, very big opportunity I think around uh, UAVs. I'm seeing Airbus starting to do a, a lot more work around uh, UAVs. Cranfield has established itself as a, a UAV uh, centre of excellence. And it's doing some really quite interesting uh, things around uh, hybrid um, hydrogen fuel cell um, UAVs around beyond visual line of sight uh, cap capability. The picture on the right was a, a very futuristic UAV that was a, a spherical UAV that could be launched from, from, the, uh, from the person. It could roll along the ground, it could, it could fly. Universities are, are, are doing some pretty amazing uh, things. And I think you know, companies keeping an eye on some of the capabilities that are being developed is a, is a, is a big big challenge and UAVs is an interesting subject because it's not always clear where the application is going to be or where the leadership is going to be. Increasingly we're seeing the, the use of UAVs at Cranfield. We have uh, UK leadership in soil science and agri-tech and there's an enormous uh, application for UAVs in, in, in the whole world of agri-food and, 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 and agri-tech big applications in things like energy and, and um, offshore wind turbine inspections and things like that. So we're seeing many, many different applications uh, emer emerging in terms of uh, UAV capability. I think probably the big game-changing technology that um, is uh, really starting to develop some kind of uh, momentum at the moment is around uh, electric aircraft. I'm not so convinced about the concept on the left there, the NASA uh, concept. I'm not even 100% convinced about some of the early um, electric uh, aircraft. I mean, there's Airbus EE fan, there's the uh, uh, electroflight demonstrator that um, is being built in, in, uh, in the UK at the moment. I think they're very good technology demonstrators whether they can be extrapolated up into the capability and the technology needed for larger aircraft is, remains to, uh, to be seen. Certainly we're a long way away from seeing it being extrapolated up to a, an A380 si sized aeroplane. But I think we're starting to see a journey on electric and hybrid electric that to my mind mirrors a little bit some of the journey we've seen on in, in automotive. I remember in my previous job talking to the chief executive of Jaguar Land Rover and it wasn't very long ago and he said, believe me, there is no way in the next decade we will see electric being applied into Jaguar. We now have a product launch of an all-electric Jaguar due in the next uh, tw 12 months. Things have moved really, really fast in automotive and I think... Um, I think we're just starting to see um, some of that in, in, in aerospace. I think there are differences in aerospace that make it a lot more challenging. Um, certainly in, in my books, the concept of range anxiety is so slightly more uh, significant in an aerospace environment than it is in a, an automotive environment. And I think battery technology itself is starting to reach uh, a, a plateau. And so unless we can find some new, um, new battery technology, increasing the energy density, we may plateau uh, out. If you look at a, a product like the, no longer built, the 319, 
but you, if you just look at that and you look at the, the relative, uh, you know, using current battery technologies, the kind of uh, additional weight, if you could hypothetically um, put batteries in, I mean, you're talking about a tonne per passenger of battery weight. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So I don't see in the very short term um, products like this um, being viable from a, an electric uh, point of view. What I think is much more likely to happen is some form of hybrid electric uh, capability. And that may happen in a more conventional kind of uh, layout. But I think when you have hybrid electric, it starts to open the mind to other configurations and, and maybe not quite as constrained as we have been in, uh, in, in the last 40, 50 years. Things like uh, distributed electric, uh, electric motor <coughs> system with the gas turbines being there just purely and simply to provide the, the electric power where the, the gas turbines could be in an in a enclosed um, part of a, say, a flying wing kind of concept. One of the things that uh, you know, we've been doing quite a lot of uh, work on is trying to look at how you can evolve hybrid electric, where the natural uh, boundaries and barriers are. And I think the EFAN kind of technologies and capability could be extrapolated up to sort of 10, 10, 15, maybe at a push 18 seater uh, aeroplanes. <coughs> I think when you go into the bigger aeroplanes, you are going to look at hybrid electric uh, solutions. And when you look at the really large aircraft, we're a long way off, but uh, some kind of super cooled uh, um, hybrid electric system is, is, is where we're headed. But again, this is the kind of fundamental research areas that universities should be working with businesses on, uh, on, on now. And it, it, it opens up the possibility for very new um, configurations. <coughs> the other aspect, just to finish on, on technology, is I'm predominantly a, an aerospace um, guy. And I've noted, um, particularly in the UK, but I suspect in a lot of other countries, that the world of aerospace and the world of aviation quite often are two very different communities that very rarely, um, very rarely get to, together. But I think digitization and the world of digital is bringing the world of aviation, whether that be airports, airspace management, airline management, bringing that much, much closer to the world of aerospace and opening up uh, very new opportunities. Universities themselves quite often have very significant business schools. I don't know that business itself takes maximum advantage of the kind of ideas and, and models that are coming out of the uh, business schools. I, I, I tend to uh, use this inside the university as, a, as an example of the music industry. I grew up very much with vinyl recordings, moved into c um, cassettes, eight track CDs, they were all technology developments around a physical medium. Suddenly the world of digital meant that those physical medium started to become obsolete. And what we had was digital solutions, Spotify, YouTube. Um, it was no longer the physical solution, it was a, a digital solution. And that for forced changes in, in business models and saw organisations, companies, shops um, completely go out of uh, business. There wasn't there wasn't the market there. Increasingly, that sort of shifts from a product basis to a service basis. And I, I know those are the kind of questions that large companies are, are asking themselves at the moment. Don't forget the capability that exists in, in, in business schools within universities to test those models. The strategy that I've developed at Cranfield is one about defining and delivering not just the aircraft of the future, but the airport of the future, the airspace management of the future, and the airline of the future, the four A's, and that, that kind of is governing the technology developments I'm looking to establish at uh, Cranfield itself. <coughs> and that draws us into CESAR, the joint undertaking, looking at new flight mani management procedures, it looks at new virtual control tower type of environments, the integration of unmanned vehicles with manned vehicles, so there's some really exciting technology opportunities in that that universities are uh, engaged in. But at the other end of the spectrum, there's some quite simple things where actually 
it is remarkable to think that we put all this technology effort into um, aircraft, really high-tech aircraft, and yet the likes of British Airways would say they have on any single day of any year one, at least one aircraft out of service down because a baggage truck or something has driven into the aeroplane. And yet the solutions, the technical solutions in terms of autonomous ground vehicles and things like that must be there to allow <coughs> different kind of ground-based solutions. And this, 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 this picture here, which I just find fascinating, again, that in that world of autonomy, when we're talking about autonomous vehicles, driverless vehicles and things like that, and yet when you look at when an, air <coughs> an aircraft lands at an airport and all of the... Uh, the, the vehicles are driven there and the, the opportunity to introduce sort of autonomous technologies into uh, the ground handling at airports must be a, a very significant opportunity. And that's something at Cranfield we're very keen to, uh, to help and, and, and try and develop. I talked a bit about vehicle health management and again I think there's some very significant uh, uh, opportunities in terms of digital, this sort of move from a product focus into a, a service focus. Some real opportunities that universities are working on at the moment. And who knows you know, where the world is leading us to and who's going to be responsible for, for what. Universities can stand back from the current industry arrangement and, and look at how things may develop. And with that four A's, aircraft, airport, airspace management, airline of, man airline of the future, what we're trying to develop is a, at Cranfield, <coughs> I've put a big bid together for a new digital aviation research technology centre <coughs> that will bring all of those uh, attributes together. <coughs> I'm hopeful that we'll get a, a positive result. The UK government's uh, um, somewhat surprised us all with its uh, decision to host a, a snap election and all announced announceables are kind of held pending that uh, general election but I'm hopeful that uh, the other side of that we may see the announcement of what I've called DARTEC our new digital aviation research <coughs> technology centre and um, it's a sandpit in terms of airport of the future it will bring airport equipment providers in it's a sandpit that will allow OEMs to look at the interaction of products and platforms on new airspace management capabilities and looking at new things like um, ground handling facilities. It brings it all together. Some very exciting technology developments in aviation as well as the technology on, on aerospace itself. So, you know, what of the future? Well, who knows? I mean, airport of the future. I've seen some spectacular images uh, recently, a big round airport where... Uh, aircraft go round. I don't know that that will, uh, will, will, will happen, but you know, we're seeing huge developments in China, Singapore, in the UK we've got uh, Heathrow um, Runway 3 developments, which I think is a, uh, a game changer. From a platform point of view, who knows, I mean, again, Airbus have been a strong promoter of uh, new uh, air taxi kind of concept, uh, an unmanned helicopter kind of uh, concept. Biomimicry, who knows what the uh, aircraft of the, uh, the future may, may look like. My sort of key message really from uh, tonight, and, and, and Tom Williams had a, a, an edit, a feature article in the London Evening Standard just um, the, um, two, two, two weeks ago, where he was promoting very strongly the need in the UK to maintain and build pipeline for future engineers. And, and one of the points he was making really strongly was we do need people that kind of understand, even if we're not working on an overall aircraft, they understand the overall aircraft, they understand the role of what's being referred to as high value design, aerodynamics, systems integration, structures uh, integration. And I thought it was a really good, um, really good sort of very, very strong article in uh, London's foremost uh, paper. And I thought that was kind of a, a good way to kind of bring it to a, to a close, a recognition of the need. And I suppose the statement and what I've tried to 
demonstrate to you this evening is the very strong role I think universities can play in helping to shape and deliver that future. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Do you am I hand it back to you or do no, you want to take your good. questions? Surely lots of questions. Uh, I'm more than happy to uh, ignore difficult questions and answer easy ones. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Any? I mean, it's, um, it's a little bit outside the scope of what I was talking uh, about tonight. Um, you know, essentially, it's a it's a government policy issue in in, in the United Kingdom, particularly at uh, undergraduate student level. Yeah. And you know, it's easy to contrast the situation when I left university. At a whale of a time, I loved university. I I I, I wouldn't say I left debt free, but but debt was largely of my own making. It was uh, <laughs> doing things that I in, in, enjoyed doing, and I joined industry, and, and, and it was great. You see students now leaving university with uh, student debt, you know, mounting up to you know, very significant sums of money, 50,000 um, pounds plus. And <coughs> I mean, I, my personal view is, I mean, it, it, it's, it is a constraining thing. Um, I think from a UK point of view, you know, you combine that with some of the changes around pension policies and things at the other end of people's lives. I thought it's a pretty tough life, you know, that working life that people are, uh, are entering. So it's a policy question whether you think it's a right thing or a, a wrong thing. Personally, I'm, I, I'm not convinced um, of it, but it <coughs> the fact of the matter is it's, it exists and it does, um, I think, create a very different environment for uh, the students leaving, particularly undergraduate, and going into uh, in, into industry. What can industry do to help that? Well, I mean, certainly some uh, companies um, do offer bursaries and, and, and graduate um, and some kind of opportunities for that. Some some what you might call more enlightened companies um, effectively write off the students' debt when they uh, join in return for. Uh, you know, signing up for a, maybe a, a, a longer period of time. I think one of the other big changes that's happening in the UK is a, is a focus on what's referred to as the apprenticeship kind of programme. And um, as of the 1st of April of this year in the UK, every company with a turnover over a given amount, it's a relatively small amount, have to pay a levy into what's called a, an apprenticeship levy uh, fund. And that's to encourage people to take uh, apprenticeship training. And that apprenticeship training has been extended up into university and, and master's mm -hmm. kind of uh, offer. So I think what you might see in the UK is a, an increasing number of um, students choosing to go down a, a graduate apprenticeship route rather than doing a, a, a more traditional university uh, course. So I think what we're seeing from a policy point of view is something that is driving different uh, d d different behaviours and in my view taking some of the fun out of, uh, of, of what is a very influential part of, of, of people's lives. Hello. Yeah, I uh, have uh, two questions. Oh, oh, one remark and one question. Uh, one remark is uh, related to my experience uh, working with a uh, university as industry, where I found uh, difficulties in uh, solving uh, first uh, the time scale of making a study with university, which uh, uh, very often was not in the right uh, piece uh, with the time <coughs> of the program development because uh, of the school art uh, timing, mm -hmm. the shortage and so forth. And 
when I made some uh, uh, good uh, trial with uh, Toulouse University, the time of getting uh, on the paper, the, the result I was looking for was about uh, three times what I was after. <laughs> because I was explained by the nice professor that uh, there was uh, the, the holidays uh, and the, the changing of the student making uh, uh, the similar studies and so forth. And it was uh, quite uh, horrible. To that was combined as well the difficulty of the of the lawyers and so about the uh, industrial properties, and it was an, an a shame, hopeful. So, uh, and I, I say, well, we have to solve that. So, uh, my my remark is that probably you have succeeded in uh, Cranfield when you have contract with uh, uh, industry. You have. Su succeeded to solve these issues and please let me know how. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the second question yeah. is more difficult. Yeah. It's about the Brexit uh, consequences. <laughs> of course, uh, allow me <laughs> to write that as a, as a French uh, fellow. Uh, it was extremely sad, but I understand uh, the, the feeling of the population, but in our life, in our uh, in where we, we work uh, together, we develop uh, together. It's uh, uh, quite uh, sad to, to see uh, that happening. So probably you are working with uh, schemes for resolution in the negotiation which uh, will be uh, starting, for taking uh, aerospace in a, in, a, in a given approach with the role of uh, research activity with ACARE, which you have mentioned, with the need uh, in Europe to be st strong in front of the bigger competitor as well. You have mentioned, I have picked up uh, the, the, uh, the European role, so you are still uh, with us, uh, we are together, <laughs> I, I feel that. Uh, but you need uh, to work with the schemes uh, accordingly. So, I mean, just a, a few remarks back, I mean, the, the easier, maybe not so easier, first question, I, I don't know if you're thinking of the same issue I'm thinking. I certainly remember one very difficult issue on a, an A340 aeroplane where uh, universities were a bit slow in coming back with their response. I think universities, I think that's where there needs to be a mutual understanding between different organisations. The university drumbeat is quite often driven by an academic year, not by an industrial milestone. Cranfield's solution to that has effectively we've put in place a company, Cranfield Aerospace Solutions, whose objectives and performance measures are driven by an industry drumbeat rather than an academic drumbeat. So there, it, so there's a, uh, an intermediary organisation whose job it is to try and pull and extract things out of the university to do things in the industrial uh, timescale. It doesn't always work. I think what I have found through my different experiences is a lot of it still gets very much driven by personal relationships. If you have good personal relationships, then you can find solutions. The IP side of things is definitely still um, an issue that constantly gets addressed and um, people find solutions and, and then other people find difficulties. There seems to be uh, Maybe you said it yourself when you involve, involve lawyers and things. They, they, they generate a, <laughs> a climate that, that searches for ways in which they can make money, perhaps. And um, so it's always there. But I, I think those things are get improving. The Brexit situation, I find, um, I'm again, on a, a you know, very personal perspective, um, I have been very fortunate through my career to have worked inside the Airbus system, which has kind of transcended different uh, countries. And, and so the cultural diversity, the, 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 you know, the working together is something I'm very, um, you know, I, I think hugely uh, stimulating. Um, universities themselves, I know, by and large, um, had a line that was uh, to remain and are now having to manage through quite a difficult 
situation whereby um, perhaps some staff may be looking to move back to Europe. There's certainly some difficulties recruiting students and there's uh, worries about the um, funding through things like Horizon 2020. I'm sitting at the moment on a, a research, uh, on a high level group under uh, Carlos Moidas, which is looking at what comes after Horizon 2020. And in most of the discussions, um, you know, the contribution that the uh, UK has made to that science and innovation agenda is, is, is recognised. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody's hopeful that we find ways of continuing to work together. But as you know, in high level politics, it's not always in, uh, yeah, in, our, uh, in our control. From an aerospace point of view, what gives me optimism is that um, I think aerospace has for decades transcended national boundaries, company boundaries, and I think where there's excellence and centres of excellence and, and capability, we have to find good ways of, of, of working together. So I know there are issues and, 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 uh, and uh, difficulties and the, uh, the same Mr Williams who talked about high value design talks quite vocally about uh, some of the Brexit issues for companies you know, as it affects companies like uh, Airbus. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful there's a community that's grown up and, and, and loves working in a collaborative uh, environment and, and we have to find good solutions to work together. Everybody else, I think, is very good. Oh, we have one question there. I can't. Thank you. My question is about business arrangements. The business objectives in manufacturing industry and the business objectives of research managers can be different with chalk and cheese often. In industry, the objective is to do the research so that you can get a better product out of the broad and reasonable timescale. Whereas <coughs> the research manager objective in academia is to demonstrate that more research is needed so that you can keep a team together. How do you find marrying this research short and research cheese? Yeah, I mean, I, th I, uh, <laughs> I think that's a perception and is true in some c circumstances and, and less true in others. Uh, my, my experience looking from a university back into an industry is, is quite often you see, even in a large corporate, you, you, you see different people with slightly different uh, ob objectives. And, and you know, to take um, a large aerospace OEM, you know, the person who is operating the uh, production line for a final assembly or something will think very differently about his objectives to the person who's trying to manage the, um, the next, you know, generation of, of products. So even in a company, there's some slightly different mindsets. Y y your argument would be, yes, but they're all still with the company objective of exploitation and commercialization in, in mind. I think you would be surprised in universities, you will also find that there are researchers who are very much at the science end of the, uh, the spectrum and, and, and who believe that if you don't have just pure science, then things won't emerge, you know, you have to have that. But there are also people in universities that are much closer to the in business way of thinking and actually what gives them more joy than anything is seeing their research work being exploited. It gives them a real, uh, uh, a real um, thrill to, to see that. So I, I don't think it's quite as black and white as saying industry thinks like that and universities think like that. I think it then comes down to people and, and you know, finding the right people to, uh, to, to interact. Certainly at Cranfield University, um, um, the reason I joined is because I think there is a strong recognition of the needs of industry and, and, and the academics want to play their part in solving industry, uh, industry problems. So it probably doesn't answer your question in a total sense. I just think it's not quite as black and white as you uh, described. Thank you.
coming more quickly. I think just, just one very quick question. I was born in Southampton. I thought Southampton was an aerospace university. And there's no mention of it. <laughs> well, there was a mention of it, actually. I went to it. <laughs> well, that's being a little bit flippant. Yeah. Um, Southampton is a strong aerospace um, university. Um, there was an implicit mention to it when I talked about that in the UK there's this association of aerospace universities. And my observation, which I said was, actually, I think there's a lot of big universities not on it. And Southampton would be one of the ones I was thinking of when I said that. Um, there's some very, very good aerospace folk have uh, graduated at uh, Southampton and you know, they play a, a, a very, very strong role in the uh, sector. And they, they do have one of the Rolls-Royce UTCs as well. Okay. So it wasn't a deliberate omission. <laughs> but a good observation, nevertheless. <laughs> and of course the Spitfire is the one there. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I think what we have to do now, we have yet another thank you to give you. Do you remember that? Which I did remember from Bill, Ford. Bill Ford, yeah. Bill Ford, anyhow. It's a memory. But I know, or, or else we can try and do something else. But thanks very much indeed, Ian, for a superb. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. We have to take a picture of you and me with the. Well, of course, yes, indeed. Yes, we'll, we'll do that. And thank of course, you. we do, we actually do them in. Well, before you probably got your, your name on it immediately, we have usually economics of circumstances. You'll be glad to know these come from Glasgow. Glasgow. <laughs> 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 and we, we get them in the back. It's the old alliance, isn't it? So, just going on to our future programme, all we have the rest of this year, of course, is our annual dinner, which is coming up on the 9th of June, Friday the 9th of June. And we encourage when is your possible of course to come along. It is at the um, Santa Villa Rock. You know that's about a forty five minute drive. I know some people find it a little difficult, but with the bypass and things I think it's getting better. Um, just to go back to there. We have the Hamburg branch coming along. They're having a visit to Toulouse and fifty of them we hope will join us at the um, our dinner and Richard Smythe is providing a speaker we hope who's going to talk about drones but we won't know about that definitely until tomorrow. I need tomorrow. That final right? confirmation. What? I need final confirmation. But yes, anyway, well, thanks to Richard. He's a famous oh. man. He's running between Toulouse and Paris. You know? uh -huh. and he's a great guy. So okay. we can get him something. Well, we hope just to, as I say, have somebody that can talk to us which Richard is very kind, and Richard, of course, is a chairman of the Hamburg branch. So that, that's to remind you of our annual dinner, and we'll be publishing the um, menu very shortly. It'll be on our website, and we can only register for one, one um, program at a time, so once we finish with here, you can register online for the, for the, for the dinner. To remind you here that um, our forthcoming program is on our website, our next lecture, of course, is on the 19th of September after the summer vacations. And you have our website, it's pretty primitive, I'm afraid, but just give the information. And a much more comprehensive website, of course, on the Royal Aeronautical Society website. But in the meantime, we can just wish you bon vacances. And we look forward to seeing you again, if not in June, at the Cape Chapel of the Rock in September. Thank you for coming tonight. And of course, thank you, Ian, for a superb and lecture tonight about universities and thank you again for our esteemed presence this action coming along so you can now talk to you about the work of the Royal Aeronautical Society thank you again for coming I hope to see you soon